Uh, I'm Wayne Johnston from the Concord Wildlife Alliance. Um, back in 2016, uh, Dennis led a tour of the of the Soother Prairie for me and a few other Concord Wildlife Alliance members, and I think some Girl Scouts or, or, or something. Uh, but uh, nowadays, it's uh, touring isn't as uh, easy as back then, and uh, perhaps Dennis uh, will explain that. Um, I'm sure you've read the information in the flyer. So let me introduce Dennis a different way. He's a conservationist, which means you already know and love Dennis, or you will. How's that? Uh, so Dennis, uh, go, please uh, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Let me pull up my slide deck. So glad to be with you all this evening. Um, as Wayne mentioned, um, things were easier to access the prairie back in the day. And because of the management that we're now um, using at the prairie, uh, it's more limited to work days uh, and educational field trips. I did one of these earlier this year for the Friends of Plant Conservation and leading up to that field trip did uh, a slide presentation um, offered by the North Carolina Botanical Gardens in uh, conjunction with the Friends of Plant Conservation. So uh, some of you may have been in on that. Um, I have added in some new stuff uh, to contextualize it for this evening and some other things that I've thought about or that have come up since then. So here we go. So um, we'll leave time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so, and feel free to stick them in the chat if you uh, are afraid you'll forget and, and that'll, we can go to the chat uh, as we go as well. So uh, this is an iconic picture of the Suther Prairie. Um, <clears throat> it has not looked like this in a while, but this is what it looked like um, in uh, springs in the past. This is, uh, you're mainly, the color you're seeing here is mainly um, Adamasca lilies and Indian paintbrush um, in a matrix of uh, native warm season grasses that are coming up. And the predominant ones there are gamma grass, big blue stem, little blue stem, um, and Indian grass. Um, prairie is about, uh, oh, uh, pushing nine acres in size uh, currently. It lies uh, on the floodplain next to Dutch Buffalo Creek um north north west of uh, the town of mount pleasant and is called the southern prairie nature preserve uh, because of the uh it's uh was uh, until recently a part of the suther uh, family farm um, they uh, graciously sold it to the state of north carolina for um protection and management as a uh, as a nature preserve. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go on. So today is World Gratitude Day, uh, September the 1st. Uh, some of you already knew that, some of you didn't, um, but you know now if you didn't know already. So I want you to think about what you're grateful for. Um, I like this particular graphic uh, that, uh, shows the world in the shape of a, uh, of a heart. And Sutha Prairie is about at the upper, uh, upper left hand corner of the letter R and the word R, what are you grateful for? Just to get you oriented. I want to open with a land acknowledgement that we are on, um, we're occupying lands that uh, belong to the Catawba Indian Nation and uh, indigenous peoples that preceded them um, in this part of the Piedmont. We know from 
um, settlements uh, to the um, just to the east of us a little bit, more mountain, uh, and in that area that um, Paleo Americans have been here for uh, over ten thousand years. Um, these have neither of these particular Native Americans that are partic per, um, are depicted here in these bronze sculptures happen to be Catawba, the, the lady on the right uh, is uh, a, a Sara town woman. This is in front of the, um, I guess it's the Museum of History on Bicentennial Plaza in Raleigh. And on the left is a, uh, is a Cherokee. Uh, and this uh, statue is in the, um, the Arboretum in Ash Asheville. But just as a reminder um, that we are settled on lands that, that were once um, lived on and stewarded by Native Americans, um, indigenous peoples. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because that's key to uh, the ex very existence of the Sutha Prairie. This is a, a, a bronze uh, plaque uh, in, in the uh, wall surrounding Settlers Cemetery in downtown Charlotte that tells the story uh, again of the settlement uh, of this area and the migration uh, patterns for Native Americans over a long period of time. Um, I'm going to read the latter part of that. By the time the Spanish arrived in the area in the 16th century, Native Americans had developed large towns, long distance trade networks, and political alliances both north and south along the Catawba River, the river to our west. They were the Yeishwa, people of the river. We would come to know them as the Catawba. After the Spanish came, European American traders and settlers, an influx of new deadly diseases and the loss of most of their ancestral land with the Treaty of Nations Ford in 1840. The Catawba Indian Nation is today centered in York County, South Carolina, just south of Charlotte, a vital part of this area's history. And I would say um, our present as well. This is a plaque um, on top of uh, Mar Mountain Again, uh, talking about the, uh, the settlement patterns uh, over time. Um, and of course, Moore Mountain is uh, adjacent to the Gatkin PD River system um, and um, to, the, to the east, which is the river basin that, uh, that everything in Cabarrus County drains to, for those of you that are from Cabarrus County. Uh, this is a mortar and pestle um, that uh, actually was found on the, the Suther farm. So that farm was uh, the, the uh, Suther um, siblings that are living now grew up on a dairy farm. Um, it was no longer a dairy farm when I moved to the county over 30 years ago. Uh, but when the land was being plowed for corn, um, you would find uh, Native American artifacts. And this is true all up and down um, Dutch Buffalo Creek. There was actually a, uh, a settlement along um, a portion of Dutch Buffalo Creek as it runs through um, Cabarrus County. And this would have been used for grinding corn. We had, uh, I don't think any of us got to see it last night, but the full corn moon. That's the Native American name for the, uh, the moon at this, uh, this time of the year, uh, close to the, uh, the equinox for autumn. Um, and this is how they processed corn, uh, which was a main staple of uh, the diet once uh, the uh, Native Americans uh, began um, settling and not doing so much of the hunter gathering routine. So, um, Suther Prairie has got several, um, several of the, um, a number, I should say, a number of the plants that have been identified, collected at Suther Prairie. Um, of, of those, some of them were sent off to um, 
a USDA, US Department of Agricultural Plant Materials Center in Cape May, New Jersey, and uh, were grown out and then released uh, to, um, to commercial um, companies. And so this is one of the releases, the Suther Indian grass. Um, some of these species, the uh, gamma grass, um, corn is a, is a grass. So um, these uh, native warm season grasses are a relative of the corn that's uh, become a, a staple in, in many parts of the world uh, in diets. I want to talk about restoration tonight. It'll seem it'll keep coming up over and over again. Um, those of you of a certain age, like myself, grew up on uh, the three R's and that, that language is still used. So reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, I like some other R's. I like refuse. So to kind of counter the, the rampant consumerism that produces so much waste and has a huge impact on our natural resources, uh, but also to restore that we need to be about the work of putting things um, back the way we found them because uh, many times the ways we've modified and manipulated them are ways that, that don't work very well. And so they take constant maintenance um, because they're not in equilibrium. That is a close up shot of um, the uh, Indian paintbrush. Uh, if you'd like to read, uh, may I suggest that you acquire a copy of John, John Lawson's um, diary, um, which has been reprinted by the University of North Carolina Press, um, but it describes this area. He came up through um, the area that we uh, now know as Salisbury, for example. Um, the second paragraph talks about passenger pigeons. He describes in that book um, that the pigeons were so thick um, when they roosted in trees at night that the Native Americans could take long um, poles and flail the, the lower limbs and the pigeons would drop out by the bushel baskets full. And of course, we all know now that there are no more pigeons because we thought they were... Um, they were an unlimited resource. Uh, references to the Scotch-Irish um, folks that settled uh, much of North Carolina, including the western part of, of um, Cabarrus County, hence the name Irish Buffalo Creek flowing out of, uh, out of Kannapolis. And then you've got Dutch Buffalo Creek uh, adjacent to the prairie that flows in the eastern um, part of the, uh, the county. There's a um, picture of the front uh, cover of the, uh, my copy of Lawson's Voyage to North Carolina. He, um, he wrote this, he was a, a um, I guess a surveyor uh, who came up out of Charleston um, in the, uh, the late 1700s. And uh, it's, a, it's a good read. And here's a, an example. We traveled this day about 25 miles over pleasant savanna ground, high and dry, having few trees upon it, and those standing at a great distance. The land was very good, free from grubs and underwood. Um, savanna is another word, was his, the word he used for these vast um, expanses of prairies of which we have very few remnants left now. I think uh, I grew up thinking and, and hearing being taught in school that a squirrel could you know, run from tree to tree all over the Eastern part of the United States and never, never touch the ground. And uh, that probably was a, an exaggeration because uh, there were a, a lot of prairies in the Eastern part of the United States. They were not just limited to the to the Great Plains as, uh, again, I was uh, brought up to believe in um, school. So we mentioned Native Americans. We're gonna talk about their role in um, 
and managing the prairies and then that role was um in setting fires um you had lightning strikes that would naturally ignite fires but also um but also the native americans would set fires to clear land or to keep land from from um going through uh succession uh so the encroachment of woody vegetation and and ultimately leading to climax forest cover in a lot of cases but the uh the buffalo um that lived in uh in, in this county and again hence the name each, um, Irish Buffalo Creek and Dutch Buffalo Creek. The buffalo were the herbivores that would have kept a, uh, a certain amount of vegetation clear as well. So um, the Suther family have records going back into the 1700s. And this was, you know, people wrote about this in their journals and whatnot as being a, a, what we now call prairie was, was referred to as a, a meadow reminded them of of open areas back in the uh, the mother country in europe and uh again our our best thinking is that 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 this was able to be maintained open by fire and by um, by buffalo grazing um, otherwise you would you know, on the banks of the dutch buffalo creek you would have a bottomland hardwood forest would be your your typical um, vegetation that you would find in a riparian area like that this is a, a photograph um, taken of some sculptures that used to be in a prairie restoration project uh, in the Mecklenburg Parks and Recreation System. Um, these were made out of um, metal um, and uh, they're actually no longer there now. I got this from the, the, the uh, staff member that, that, that welded these together. But just we can we could dream right of, of what that that scene would look like by the way um it's my understanding i don't know what anyone knows for sure but i'm i'm the first generation born off of a farm that's been in my family since 1789 that's located in the highest elevation cove valley in in tennessee um it's between boone and bristol right off of 421 so when I go to the farm, um, once you cross into North Carolina and, and enter Johnson County, Tennessee, where the farm is, um, there the first community that you come to an unincorporated area is called Trade, uh, Tennessee, and that actually it was named Trade, just like Trade Street in Charlotte. It was it was a trading route, um, and so the Native Americans followed uh, animal trails, and uh, eventually 421 ended up being built. Uh, in that same area and it goes through a pass in the mountains there um, uh, outside of Boone, northwest of Boone. Um, and so it's believed that 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 was the, the way that the buffalo uh, crossed um, into the eastern United States and into uh, including Cabarrus County. There's a close up of one of those uh, wire sculptures after a uh, controlled burn uh in uh, in that prairie location in mecklenburg county in the parks and rec system so uh again the you know mentioned the scotch irish that settled the western part of cabarrus county and, the, and mostly in mecklenburg county but uh in the eastern part of the county you had uh folks out of switzerland germany um they were by by faith they were reformed um christians uh and so uh, you know saint john's lutheran church where the suthers go to church is uh, it and organ church up in southern rowan county um kind of have a friendly uh contest going among themselves as to which congregation it was was the first one established in north carolina that that now rep um, as part of the Lutheran Church. This is uh, on South Union Street, uh, historical marker. Um, and uh, another historic marker, um, the, one of the early Suthers. Um, this is at the intersection of uh, Highway 73, east of Concord, um, 
just before you get to uh, where Gold Hill Road branches off at the um, Exxon service station convenience um, store. So uh, the uh, state of North Carolina was able to purchase uh, 80 or so acres off of the Suther family. Um, there is a house, uh, a, 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 um, a homestead still on that, that property on a knoll up above the prairie. Um, this was owned by the uh, Ritchie family. Some of you may know uh, Ritchie Bell who uh, wrote a uh, Flora of North Carolina um, book, Tome, Bible of, um, and um, so he was related to the, uh, these Richies that, that, that inhabited this house. You're gonna get as much cultural history in this presentation as you are uh, botany, uh, and I hope you're not disappointed by that. Um, but it's all part of the part of the story. This is a, a, a house for um, this may have been where the riches lived before the big house was built. Um, don't know that anyone really knows that. Note the uh, the hat rack on the wall. This uh. This house, this is the smaller house, had a, um, a vulture nesting in it uh, over the summer. And um, I had heard a presentation by a graduate student at UNC Charlotte uh, for the Mecklenburg Audubon group. And um, when, when I flushed some vultures uh, out when I was walking on the site, um, I don't know if that was earlier this year or, or late last year, but anyway, I put the graduate student onto it and took her out there early in the season, and she set up a uh, a cam um, and uh, recorded um, the laying, um, incubating, hatching uh, of that egg uh, and the uh, the uh, fledgling uh, vulture uh, taking off out into the world. One other thing I wanted to say about this too is we know that 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 the that this family owned owned uh, people in in servitude um, that that did a lot of the work building that big house. This is a chimney um, that's made out of hand uh, hand fired bricks. Uh, undoubtedly, the clay was mined on site, um, and so not only recognizing the Native Americans that made our existence possible, but also um, enslaved peoples um, that uh, did a lot of the hard, hard, hard labor um, that um, went along with the settlement of Cabarrus County. Uh, this is a, an old timey uh, piece of barbed wire uh, back when it was made out of one piece of stamped metal and then twisted. Not like uh, most of you would be familiar with the barbed wire now. It's usually a couple strands of wire and then barbs that are twisted around um, the uh, the horizontal pieces of wire that are that are run from one fence post to the next. Uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, so the Suther Prairie is actually on the edge of the Carolina Slate Belt. That's the area associated with, um, uh, with gold in, um, in North Carolina and in Cabarrus County in particular. Uh, and that lies between the coastal plain and the, uh, and the Piedmont region. And here we are back to that iconic photograph again, a uh, photograph taken by uh, John Suther, uh, one of the siblings that uh, is now deceased. So um, from, uh, from a, a state website, we don't say a whole lot about the plants that are identified out there uh, to um, keep down uh, potential for poaching, but uh, these are on the uh, on the internet, on the uh, 
Friends of Plant Conservation website. So Canada Lily, uh, and that's one of the main reasons that the uh, that the prairie uh, that the state had an interest in in, in getting a preserve there is um, their preserve system protects um, the best known populations of plants that are um, you know are imperiled and uh, need a lot of helping hands to uh, make sure that we don't lose them um, in North Carolina. And the other is the, the small sun drops on the right. I can remember when I first, so the, the prairie, the, uh, Cabarrus County, when I, when I arrived in 1990, I wrote a grant to get funds from the state of North Carolina through the Natural Heritage Program um and got the county commissioners to match those funds so we had fifteen thousand from each source that put together thirty thousand um dollars and we hired um habitat assessment and restoration project which was um headed up by jim matthews who was the chair of the um biology department at unc charlotte before he retired and so he and some folks working with him um combed over the county and and identified the the best uh, undisturbed natural areas that we had when i first went out there um this is kind of gives you an idea this is catherine um mccray i'm not sure how far she's standing away from me or whoever took the picture but i can remember being out there collecting seeds the the fall after we first identified that site as part of the heritage survey and someone could have been standing uh and and were you know 10 feet away from me and you wouldn't even be able to see them the grass was so thick it really looked like a, a typical midwestern prairie and what you're seeing here these taller grasses are um that's mostly big blue stem the the shorter stuff it would be uh, a lot of that is Indian grass and little blue stem. Been attracted a lot of researchers. Um, there was a um, at least one master's student at UNC Charlotte that did his uh, his master's thesis on the site. Um, this is a paper authored by um, um, Robert Tompkins who teaches at Belmont Abbey. Um, Catherine McRae, um, Luckenbach is her married name, and I'm, I've actually never met the other four authors on that paper, but I can see that it looks like a lot of them are affiliated with Clemson University. Um, just gives you an idea of the distribution of plants uh, at one point in time, and it's constantly changing in response to a number of factors including you know how recently it was burned or uh, for a while um, Lewis Suther was um, mowing hay and again these the mowing the hay would would be the closest approximation to what it would be like to remove some of the forage or the biomass um, by the herbivores um, the, the buffalo um, but you can see that the graminoids which are the grasses uh, constitute a big um, the majority of the plants that are out there, followed by the shrubby stuff, things like button bush, um, and then your your forbs. Um, there are legumes out there, uh, a number of different kinds of lespedezas, and then things in the aster family, which is, uh, I guess, the largest uh, group of flowering plants. Went to a presentation that Larry Mellon Champ, who's the retired head of the Botanical Garden at UNC Charlotte did on, on that uh, Astor family. So this is another um, a, uh, document, uh, like a flyer brochure describing another one of the plants, the big blue stem at uh, per Suther Prairie. Um, the seed heads on those are, are typically uh, described as looking like turkey feet, and you got kind of three different uh, seed branches of the seed head that uh, give it that name. And you can see the distribution um, map for that uh, as part of this flyer. 
And we also I mentioned Little Blue Stem, but there is a, a flower brochure on the Little Blue Stem distribution as well. Uh, some of you would recognize this picture. It distorted a little bit when I um, drug it to fill up the slide, but this is a, a picture taken during the Dust Bowl days out in the, uh, the Midwest, and that would have been the area kind of where Texas and Oklahoma and um, New Mexico kind of come together. Um, that Dust Bowl is actually what gave rise to the conservation district movement in uh, in the United States. Um, Hugh Hammond Bennett, a native of North Carolina, a native of Anson County, uh, and a graduate of, uh, he was a Tar Hill, graduate of UN, uh, UNC Chapel Hill with a chemistry degree, um, was successful in, in getting the United States government to set up a, a, a federal program to respond to the Dust Bowl. And, and he, uh, the, a quaint story about how um, when he was trying to get the legislation adopted in Washington, um, this is back before air conditioning, of course, in the, uh, in the 30s, and uh, dust was blowing in the windows of the halls of Congress that was blowing off the farms in, um, in the Midwest, and he he called attention to it, and you know basically said, you know, look, gentlemen, there come there comes the topsoil off the farms in the Midwest, and and he got his program. Um, this is uh, the uh, conservation district um, sign honoring the Suther family as the conservation farm family of the year uh, about a decade ago. Um, so they're their care in this generation for the land is part of the, the conservation ethic that, that, that uh, comes out of that soil and water conservation district um, initiative in the United States. There is a social sciences institute um, that's part of the Natural Resources Conservation Service that did a, uh, one of their technical reports on, as you can see, stewardship, spirituality, and natural resources conservation, a short history. And uh, these are some quotes from that. Before dur and during the 1930s, stewardship seemed to have a religious connotation and was not associated directly with conservation. This period was clearly an era of agricultural degradation. The worldwide depression propelled by agricultural scarcities and high food prices was exemplified in America by the natural resource disasters such as the Dust Bowl. Okay. Technical difficulties. The origin of Soil and Water Stewardship Week goes back to 1946. It later became known as Soil Stewardship Sunday, the first day of Soil Stewardship Week. In 1955, the National Association of Conservation Districts, and that's, that's 3,000 districts across uh, all 50 states and territories, took over the national sponsorship and expanded it from a regional to a national level as the observance grew rapidly in the rural areas of the United States. Stewardship of natural resources has changed greatly since the beginning of the 20th century. For many farmers and ranchers, their traditional land and water ethic has endured. Many in the countryside manage land resources because it is the right thing to do. Others protect natural resources because of regulations or the threat of regulation. Although the voluntary protection of natural resources has changed, many stewardship elements are still encased in spirituality, which may ensure its permanence. So every week, the last Sunday in April to the first Sunday in May is observed as Soil and Water Stewardship Week. There's a different theme each year. Um, the theme last year was uh, for, well, I'm sorry, earlier this year was forestry. I don't know. Uh, so one of the slides that I added in to change this one from the presentation I gave back in the spring was uh, listening to Morning Edition on National Public Radio out of WFAE in Charlotte uh, this morning. There was a spot 
talking about uh, conservation initiatives that uh, are being advanced by the Biden administration. Some of you may have heard about a 30 by 30 initiative, uh, but they, they kind of got into the whole area that, that of preservation versus conservation. So a lot of times conservation is equated with wise use. Preservation is seen as you know more like locking something away. So an example would be the national forest system in the United States, which is in the Department of Agriculture. Those are managed forests um, with some inclusions of wilderness uh, areas that are permanently protected by congressional authorization. On the other hand, you've got national parks where you don't allow hunting and, um, and, and trees aren't being, being cut for, for timber. Uh, might be uh, one way of looking at, at that. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to that program because it kind of talked about you know, where the rubber hits the road in terms of policy decisions right now. And, and uh, I'm gonna encourage us uh, by the time we're done uh, to consider becoming advocates for, um, for better management practices that will be a part of, uh, to help us be part of the solution rather than being part of the problem and be about the work of restoration. The picture of Lewis uh, mowing the prairie. That gives you some idea of what kind of yield you can get off of uh, the grasses that are produced. Uh, these native warm season grasses. These grasses, by the way, are well adapted to our conditions. They don't need a lot of uh, fertility and a lot of our soils uh, are not that fertile. Um, they, um, the hotter it is, it seems like the better they, they, they like it. So um, typically hay in this area would be fescue. Fescue is actually a cool season grass that's more adapted to a, a more Northern climate like Kentucky, so, hence Kentucky 31 fescue. Um, in the heat of the summer, it doesn't do much. Um, my yard would, would, would be proof of that this summer. But these native warm season grasses are well, well, well adapted to the conditions in the, the, the Piedmont. So some of the hay that was uh, collected off the Sucer Prairie was taken over to Mecklenburg County, and that's actually what they used to do prairie restoration. So here you see some folks scattering, uh, scattering hay out with the, the seed heads that are, that are in it and attached to it uh, to, to get a uh, get a prairie started there. So that's what an example, a good example of a restoration project. Uh, that land could have well been prairie back in the day and then it got farmed, you know, maybe when cotton was king and then, uh, you know, ultimately ended up reverting to uh, back to forest land. And, and uh, you know, so the, the, because of the importance of the diversity of habitats, um, Mecklenburg's uh, Parks and Rec is making sure that, that there are more prairies uh, to replace, you know, so much of the prairie acreage that's been lost over the years. This is uh, another picture of the prairie um, in uh, summer. You can tell in like the upper half where I'm running my cursor, that is a low area. So where the, the, from the perspective of the person taking the picture, that's actually higher ground because the creek runs back to the edge of the woods here. So this is a lower area and you can see that it's a different color. It's because the vegetation in there is not as thick. You've got things that, that can only stand wetter feet, so to speak, wetter root systems. And so uh, it actually shows up differently in the coloration there. That is a uh, dormant season uh, picture of the prairie. Um, and I don't know if it was burned after this picture was taken or not, but uh, we burned the prairie uh, in late winter this year when it looked about like that. And uh, boy, does a fire really run through there quick. And when it gets into all that dense uh, biomass from the, the previous year's vegetation, case in point, this is not this past year's burn, but in a previous year's burn. But uh, 
when the wind conditions are right, the fire will really carry through there uh, quickly. You have to know what you're doing to make sure um, that things don't get out of control. And again, this reduces the biomass, returns fertility to the soil. Uh, it's just the, the prairie plants are adapted to this type of, a, of a, a management because uh, it mimics natural conditions. That is button bush that we talked about earlier. One of the shrubby species that's out there. I've got button bush planted in my native, uh, native um, wildflower um, habitat here at my house. This is what the website for North Carolina plantfriends.org, that's the Friends of Plant Conservation. And uh, the, whoa, come back here. The, um, the URL is for, you know, clicked on preserves. So you can go there and look more about, learn more about the preserve system as it exists now. Um, at the time that I took this slide, which was earlier this year, I don't, think things have changed. There's over 14,000 acres of conservation preserves in the uh, plant conservation program, which is in the Department of Agriculture uh, in the state of North Carolina. I wanted to say a word about, so there, there are other protected sites in the state, in, in, in the state of North Carolina, and in, in Cabarrus County. So in the, uh, not in the Department of Agriculture, but in the, uh, another side of state government, uh, our state historic site system, Reed Gold Mine. So um, I'm wanting to just put this slide in by contrast with Suther Prairie. So uh, glittering gold gets a lot of attention, but I'm, I'm hoping through this presentation tonight to draw our attention to green gold which is what the soups or prairie represents uh, and recognize that it is an important site in and of its own right. Uh, and uh, delighted to have the opportunity to present this information tonight to a broader audience since uh, the access to the site is limited. Uh, unlike Reed Gold Mine that you can go to, um, I think it's open actually 365 days a year. Um, some other examples of sites that get managed, uh, owned and managed by the state of North Carolina would be uh, our, our roadsides. So um, most of us would be familiar with the wildflower program um, in North Carolina. This is an evolution. It used to be that they planted a lot of exotic species like uh, poppies uh, in the medians, particularly along the interstates. And in recent years, there's been more of a, of a trend towards planting um, more native species. Uh, to my knowledge, though, there's not yet an effort to present, uh, to plant rather, um, locally uh, native species, such as the, um, the kinds of, uh, um, using the varieties, um, the unique germplasm from species that are endemic to areas like the Sitha Prairie within Cabarrus County. So one of the tools for doing uh, restoration, one of the, the programs that exists is the Wildlife Feder um, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission has a green growth toolbox uh, program. Um, I actually worked with the various and sundry planning entities um, from the planning staffs from the county and the municipalities in Cabarrus County and uh, try and brought in resource people from the Wildlife Resources Commission and stakeholders. Um, memory is not going to help me remember tonight whether we had folks from the Wildlife Alliance uh, at the table or not, but I'm pretty sure we did maybe even Glenda might have been there, um, but uh, so our planning and zoning ordinances were revised uh, to um, and our land use plans to incorporate some of the tools that are in this green growth toolbox. Um, 
But the idea being that we can do things uh, differently and coexist with wildlife and with, with natural resources. Um, we don't have to do a wholesale. I saw this on my way home today. There's a, uh, a large clearing going in on old, old Salisbury Road at, at the intersection with Brantley Road, and that's near Lane Street. So there's a large area that's being cleared and leveled out there. And I heard through the grapevine that that's going to be, I think somebody actually said they thought it was another Amazon location. But uh, you're seeing a lot of that along the, uh, the I-85 corridor in uh, through the Piedmont. So every inter, uh, interstate uh, exit all the land around that, it's being gobbled up over time for these distribution uh, warehouse centers. There are ways to do development that work more with the natural contours of the land, with the topography of the land, um, that don't wholesale clear everything and, and, and um, move soil from one place to the other so that there's nothing natural really left at the end of the day. Uh, don't have to say much to you all about Butterfly Highway um, as, a, as an initiative um, with the, the Wildlife Federation. What I did want to say is uh, I'm hoping that over time programs like this and like Green Growth Toolbox will look uh, more and more locally at what's unique in a local area. So, for example, in Cabarrus County, um, we could focus not just on generic pollinator habitat, but working to use the, the, the um, particular ecotypes of plants that we know are native here. So now you can actually go through companies like Ernst Conservation Seeds, a company in Pennsylvania, uh, which has done collecting in the Suther Prairie, and then they've gotten these plant materials releases from the plant material center. So these varieties are, are available commercially now and could be used in, in doing restoration work and creating pollinator gardens. Or I would like to see us actually start calling those uh, maybe pocket prairies uh, in recognition that we're actually restoring prairie habitat, um, including the grasses and not just the, the colorful uh, forbs. So we're back to this slide again, World Gratitude Day. Today, September the 21st, what are you grateful for? And uh, it's a wrap uh, with uh, recognition of uh, our, uh, all the people, all the entities that, that made the Suther or Prairie preserve possible, including our, our county commissioners, the local conservation district, uh, habitat assessment restoration program, Mecklenburg Parks and Rec that, that came over and did burns for us um, a, a number of times, um, the Clean Water Management Trust Fund, which was the source of funding to purchase the land from the Suthers and then turn it over to the plant um, conservation program for uh, permanent perpetual management and stewardship. Um, the North Carolina Forest Service has also assisted with burns out there. The Heritage Program, along with the county commissioners, as I said earlier, pre presented uh, or came up with funding in the beginning to uh, do our natural heritage inventory of the county, which helped us recognize the significance of the Suther Prairie. Uh, Wildlife Resources Commission um, has been out on the prairie uh, a number of times, helping out with management over the years, uh, as well as the Three Rivers Land Trust, that's formerly the Land Trust for Central North Carolina. Um, UNC Charlotte, a um, number of the professors there, uh, Drs. Uh, Larry Barden and Larry Mellenchamp or, and Jim Matthews are all retired now, but the three of those in particular um, spent a, a lot of time working with the Suther family and working out at the prairie over the years. And last but not least, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Some of you may know Laura Fogo. Laura's um, been out there quite a bit um, as well. And then uh, not to leave out um, 
in deference to the slides that we in discussions we had earlier on god or the great spirit um the native peoples and the suther family so uh, we can open it up for questions great um yeah, I see two typed in so far, but I will selfishly ask my two questions first. <laughs> um, is the I heard the prairie described as a wet prairie. Is that does that explain why it was never farmed and so became a state of prairie? Uh, so it could have been hard to till at times because it was wet. Yeah, that's true with a lot of the floodplain areas, which is it's unfortunate that that you know i mean when it's dry then yeah you can grow stuff there and so a lot of a lot of the not only the prairies need to be restored but streams need to be restored a lot of our streams got straightened out back in the day by by farmers that didn't know any better just like the farmers that were plowing the prairies out in the midwest so you go in and straighten a stream thinking that it'll help you drain that bottomland better so that you can crop it but what happens is the then the stream is not in equilibrium, and so it starts you know hammering it at, at the shore banks on either side. So the banks are getting wider and the channels are getting deeper. Uh, a good example of this would be um, uh, Afton Run, where it runs through Dorton Park before it comes into uh, Cottle Creek there at Poplar Tent Road. So that channel, that's not a natural stream. You shouldn't be able to park a, a van or a school bus or a tractor trailer in a stream channel. Um, it shouldn't be that wide and that deep. And so um, the, it, it could be that those soils were too wet, but then also the fact that there was moisture there meant that, that they could always get grass there. And so you needed that forage for your your animals to feed as much as you might have needed, you know, cotton or corn or whatever you would have been growing, you know, back in the 1700s when moving to the area. And so, um, and again, it reminded them of their, their homeland. So for all those reasons, um, they left it be. All right. And uh, is there any unique wildlife or numbers of wildlife that uh, live there at least part of the year because of the prairie? Well, so um, there hasn't been as much focus on wildlife there. Um, we did get um, David um, Grant, who is a um, professor emeritus from Davidson College, who is a an arachnid or spider specialist out there. Um, the thing that comes to mind about the Suthers is wild turkey. So the, um, you know, wild turkey were hunted out of the Piedmont the same way passenger pigeons were hunted out and they were reintroduced. Uh, I'm thinking in the 80s, maybe even in the 90s after I came here. But anyway, the Suther farm was one of the first, if not the first places that wild turkeys were reestablished. Um, and that's because the Suthers had um, eight or 900 acres, contiguous acres put together. And so you needed large expanses like that to, uh, to resettle them. And so, you know, a lot of the wild turkeys in North, in Cabarrus County are descendants of turkeys that were introduced on the Suther farm. So it's always a treat when you're going out there to see wild turkeys running around. Um, and it's not uncommon to, to see them when you're out there. Um, in Dutch Buffalo Creek, there are some mussel species that are not common. And so um, that creek actually has a permanent conservation easement along it, uh, courtesy of the, um, actually that was through not the Clean Water Management Trust Fund, but the, uh, the Wetland Restoration Program or the Ecosystem uh, Management Program put a permanent conservation easement along the creek to protect it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Laura Fogo had spent a fair amount of time out there. So yeah, the, the mussels in the creek would probably be among the most uh, rare ones. And I guess this would be a point in time also to say, you know, the kinds of changes that we've made on the landscape 
feral pigs. So feral pigs are a, are a problem uh, throughout much of the county, including at the Suther Prairie. So um, they are being uh, thinned out um, because they'll, they could destroy, you know, rare plants in a heartbeat. Those Canada lilies, they would love to root out the, the Canada lily bulbs um, and eat them as a delicacy. Um, so that's kind of on the other side, probably of where you were going with your question, but certainly, you know, part of what we have to manage for is not only what's there that we want there, but stuff that's not there that we are, you know, trying to keep at bay. Deer are, are, are thick in there. Um, I, I've got a little bit of, um, um, well, what's the word? I'm, I'm a little bit gun shy. And so, you know, you're walking out to these thick grasses and a, and a, a fawn or a larger deer spring up about 10 feet away from you. Um, it, it can give you quite a start. So def, definitely deer out there. And after a burn, I mean, that's, you know, there's give and take with burns. You heard a lot of this after, after Mount um, St. Helens erupted. For those of you that are old enough to remember when that happened, um, but you know, there, you know, you will, uh, like this past burn, um, the burn this past, uh, winter, um, there was a, a, a nest of goose eggs that got cooked in the fire. Um, so you, you do have some collateral damage like that. Occasionally you'll find a, a charred box turtle shell. Um, but the stuff that can move pretty quick is, is going to get out ahead of the fire. All right, uh, Suzanne typed a question. Why were the buffalo sculptures removed from the Mecklenburg Prairie and any chance they might be replaced? I don't remember that story. Um, I, I wanted to use a slide that I had permission to use. And so I went back to my friends with Mecklenburg Parks and Rec to get that and um, there was some management decision that they decided to move them, and I don't remember what it was now. And then they, so they were sold to somebody else to display them, and I also don't remember that. But if you're really, really, really curious, <laughs> we can get an answer to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Michael Jemison asked, are there any in indigenous people still associated with the prairie? There are not, and I'm, I'm wondering myself if there might be some ways to make that happen in the future. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm gladdened about um, with the management uh, of our um, Department of Interior under uh, Secretary uh, Halen is the, that Native Americans are being brought into making management decisions on lands that were historically, um, you know, settled by them and, and were, again, taken, uh, taken against their will. And uh, so it would be interesting to see down the line. I, I've thought the same thing about our family farm, which is in in uh, traditional Cherokee territory and how they might be a part of that farm's uh, future going forward. A very good question to ask and certainly central to that theme of restoration. And, and as I acknowledged at the very beginning tonight, the, you know, stewardship is not something, you know, that, that uh, European Americans came up with. There was definitely a stewardship ethic that was um, going on um, prior to our arrival on the scene. Sure. Uh, Glenda remember, remembers the green growth toolbox effort. Yay! Uh, but uh, finally, the very first question I think that came in was Alex Rankin asks, uh, if you grew up under Snake Mountain. <laughs> I did not grow up under Snake Mountain. So uh, uh, I grew up under Mill Mountain. I was born in, in Roanoke Memorial Hospital in the Roanoke Valley, which uh, some of you may know that Roanoke's moniker is the Star City of the South. They're the largest, you know, uh, I think still the largest uh, star in the world, or at least the United States, is the top of that mountain. But no, where is Snake Mountain? Uh, maybe Alex will type it in, but I guess... 
I don't see anybody typing, so that might be all for the night. <laughs> I did uh, one thing I'll, I'll say. Uh, I was I had a doctor's appointment today, and it had some inspiration during the doctor's appointment. But it, I was an hour late getting in there, and so didn't get home uh, in time to um, add some slides in. But I was I was wanting to channel Aldo Leopold in tonight. Uh, some of you know Aldo Leopold. He was um, he's in the National Wildlife Federation's Hall of Fame, like me, a trained forester, uh, but he was noted at the University of Madison, of Wisconsin Madison uh, for establishing the field of wildlife management. Uh, but he wrote a seminal work called Sand County Almanac. This is the, the, the 50th anniversary edition of that book uh, in which he lays out a, uh, a land ethic and um, he talks about uh, the first rule of intelligent tinkering being to save all the parts. And um, that's, I think, very informative, uh, very wise, uh, very uh, wise uh, thing to say. And again, um, having all the parts, having the, 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 the uh, ecotypes for Suther big blue stem, Suther little blue stem, and uh, Suther Indian grass and, and starting to use those in the landscape. Um, and certainly we want to protect areas like the Suther Prairie, but, you know, and, and we would like for, I'd like to see through efforts like the Green Growth Toolbox that we're not doing same old, same old subdivisions here, but the subdivisions that are done in Cabarrus County going forward would be unique to Cabarrus County um, and work more with the existing topography, a lot less of the massive grading that goes on. But, um, you know, setting aside areas um, and, and reestablishing prairie as part of the, part of the construction of the uh, subdivisions. The other thing I meant to mention, and, and I just thought of it just now, so I'm also involved with the Extension Master Gardeners, and so the wildlife uh, Cabarrus Wildlife Alliance provided some grant money for establishing a pollinator garden um, at the uh, extension offices building. And I tried, unfortunately, unsuccessfully to uh, encourage them to envision that as a um, prairie, pocket prairie, um, and use some of these species in the establishment of the prairies. So some of you that are, that are like founders and shakers and movers within the Wildlife Federation, um, sorry, <laughs> the Concord Wildlife Alliance might want to think about going forward about designating some of your funding for projects that would use local plant materials um, and, and, and do something that's unique uh, that would reflect the uniqueness of Cabarrus County and not just, you know, the kind of pollinator garden when you, you would see when you go to the governor's mansion in, in Raleigh, for example, but would have something that's unique to Cabarrus County um, to reflect that. And, you know, if you can have signage as part of those uh, efforts, it'll help spread the word about um, the Suther Prairie and other prairies, remnant prairies that exist or pocket prairies that exist in the county as a way of educating since, you know, not everybody's gonna, gonna find the, the time and the opportunity to go out there and actually see it for themselves. Um, Greg Wilson asks a question, I'm not sure I understand it, but he says he's aware of land surveyors notes about bison and other early European accounts, but have we found any physical evidence of bison in North Carolina and the East? I, I am pretty sure that I have read about in archaeological digs, you know, where they found um, bones and things of that. So we know, you know, by evidence of what was here. Um, and, and again, you know, the buffalo were still here in those, those diary accounts. And, and actually, um, let me think, uh, the intersection of... Gold Hill Road and Mount Pleasant Road on the what I would call the southeast corner um, 
one of the old timers told me that that was known locally as a buffalo wallow. So we've got areas in the county where we've got really tight clay in the subsoil and water will just stand during the rainy season on the surface. Um, there's a soil type called Sedgefield that's particularly noted for that. I rented a house that was built on Sedgefield for about 10 years and it was uh, an interesting 10 years. Um, but yeah, so the, the buffalo would, uh, I mean, it, it's, I, I have no doubt that buffalo actually did go to that area uh, to wallow, to get water and to coat their hides with mud uh, to ward off insects and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, there's another one of those upland depressions that's on the ridge that uh, runs from Gold Hill up in Rowan County all the way down to Reed Gold Mine. You cross that ridge when you're going on 49 towards Ashboro, just after you go past the uh, Lentz Harness Shop Road where the uh, fire station is. Um, I've gone up there in July uh, some years when there was still water in that upland depression on top of that ridge and it was just churned up by deer hooves. There were deer prints everywhere because it was a source of water and they didn't have to go down to the bottom of the hill to the nearest creek to, to get water. Um, and also the, um, uh, I've been up there with wildlife biologists uh, looking at spring um, ephemeral species, you know, um, frogs laying eggs because it's an isolated wet area. So there no, there's no predation from fish. And so it's a place um, where they can safely lay, lay their, um, raise their young. Um, one of those four components of habitat, right? Water, food, shelter, and a place to raise young. Right. Yep. Okay. I think that's about it here. So uh, we have to thank you very, very much, uh, Dennis. This was great. Very informative. Glad to do it had a good group tonight. I wasn't, wasn't sure what to expect in terms of numbers, but uh, it's a good good turnout. I think, I think more folks were with us tonight virtually than the last time I did an in-person presentation for the uh, Alliance. Yeah, I think there is another online meeting somewhere in, in the area, so we might have more people watching afterwards also. Cool, cool. All right, well, I, I don't know how, who stops this, but... Uh, guess that's about it. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.